Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to the laureate of the 2018 Tan Prize in Sinology, Dr. Stephen Owen. And please welcome Dr. Yoshinobu Shiba. And please welcome our host, Dr. David Wong. Good afternoon, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to join us at the Laureate Lecture for the 2018 Tum Prize in Sinology. To begin with, we would like to invite to the stage the host of this lecture, Dr. David Wong, academician of Academia Sinica, to give us the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Wong. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is a truly a great honor and a pleasure for me to introduce two most distinguished scholars in the field of Sinology. They are also the recipients of the 2018 Tang Prize in the field of Sinology. Professor Steve Owen and Professor Yoshinobu Shiba. They each represented the highest standard of excellence in their respective field of concentration. For Professor Owen, classical Chinese literature, particularly in the field of poetry and the poetics. Professor Shiva, pre-modern socio-economic history, particularly with a concentration on Song Dynasty commerce and societal dynamics. Their work, their dedication, their insight, and their impact have inspired many young scholars um, already, and I'm, I believe many of you, us here have read their works and admire their scholarship. Today, they are going to give um, uh, lectures on new topics, which I'm sure will be extremely illuminating and inspiring, and uh, definitely this is a great opportunity for us to listen to their talks and to share their wisdom with us. 各位女士, 各位先生, 这是一个非常难得的机会, 在2018年的汉学奖, 我们请来两位大师, 美国的语文所安教授, 以及日本的斯波义进教授, 语文所安教授的成就是在古典中国文学, 尤其是唐代的诗歌以及诗学, 斯波教授的专长是宋代的社会史和经济史, 但是他们两个人各自的专长都延伸到其他的领域, 他们的治学的精神, 他们对于学问的向往以及专注数十年如一日。在今天，我们很难得的有机会在场聆听他们在得奖之后的第一次的演讲，各自带来新颖的题目。我想我们一定能够从他们的演讲中得到新的启发以及体会。So I would like to first to introduce Professor Steve Owen. And he's going to talk about something extremely interesting. And I just got this topic. The topic is meaning in literature, the bamboo in the breast and the bamboo in the belly. I'm particularly honored to introduce Professor Owen because he is my colleague at Harvard University. This is great to be reunited with Steve here in Taipei. Steve, now we have to thank Yu Wen So An Jiao Shou to give his speech. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I find myself here. Uh, I had to have a fine find a topic, and I wanted the topic came sort of came out of the award. Uh, since this was an award for synology, I wondered what we mean by synology. It was clearly not the idea of synology I knew when I was a graduate student. Um, it's now paired with Hanshia which I always thought of in its Japanese pronunciation as kangaku. I don't know what it is. 
I learned from the people introducing the Tong Prize that, the Tong, that it's a very, supposed to be a very broad term encompassing many fields, but not thinking of them as a unity. And I had to put this up. So I did what we all do. I looked on the web and Wikipedia to find out what Synology was or Hanshia was. It turns out that it is uh, it, only for foreigners. Oh my goodness. Um, but it's interesting because this includes a negative. You see, you wonder what's not Synology. And you learn that what's not Synology is Guoxia. Because, of course, I can't do Guoxia. Because it's Buxia, what a Guoxia. So I can't possibly do Guoxia. Um, can this possibly be intellectual interesting? And I think, actually, it can be. Uh, Guoxia, of course, includes all non-Chinese. I wonder who it does, you know, does it include people who were born in Singapore or Malaysia? And it's all these problems arise in my head, if they can do Guoxia or not. Um, and it claims to understand from the inside. Hanxia, on the other hand, includes foreigners and looks from the outside. Now, I frankly, I'm sorry to say to the Guoxia people, I don't believe anybody in the 21st century is still looking at 12th century literature from the inside, unless they're very, very, very old. <laughs> and I don't think they're that old. I worry about that, those people. Um, <clears throat> But literature is uh, very good at giving life to ideas. We literature scholars like to work from texts, through texts. And I have a great one, I think, trying to think about what's Guoxia and what's Hanxia. A great text by Su Dong Po. This seems to offer a section for the Guoxia scholars and a section for the Hanxia scholars. Um, different modes of knowledge in literature, and the two actually may need each other. You may not be able to have good Guoxia without Hanxia. You may not be able to have good Hanxia without Guoxia. The first one, Guoxia, sounds very Chinese, the first part. It gives you a Cheng Yu. You know, Sheng Yu Cheng Zhu. Oh, we love stories, texts that give us a chung, uh, chung yu. The other is very, very smart, with deep insight into the world of the Song Dynasty. And it's something that doesn't have a precedent anywhere. Okay. Now I've got to find where I'm going here, because I've got to go on to my text. Um, the text, and this is the famous text for... His old friend, Huan Tong, who had passed away that same year in 1079. And in autumn, Su Shi is airing his, airing his pa paintings. You know, in autumn, you have to take your paintings out and hang them up so they dry and don't get bugs in them over the winter. And he starts thinking about this text, this painting. Right? And the text involves two moments. The first one is one in which Wan Tung speaks to Su Dong Po as a master, that is, Wan Tung is the master. He himself is, you know, someone who is himself in change, but someone who speak, imparts a lesson that only a master can impart. He's not going to change his mind tomorrow. Somebody who already knows. The second moment, Wan Tung is a person in change. He has no control over his life. He's not a master of anything. He's helpless in face of the world he's in. And to see these two one tongues together is, I think, an interesting moment. Probably only Su Dung Po could have written this essay. People of his own time and people now recognize he was the genius of his age. But even though only Su Dung, Su Dung Po could have written it, the writing is successful only because everybody who read it in the Song Dynasty understood, especially the second part, what was true of it. 
It made assumptions that people all understood. They knew all those nice things you say about painting are not really true. <laughs> that the world is messier than that. On this level, we're not just talking about individual genius, but in shared understanding that occurs in a single age. The significance of the second part does not lie in the surface claim, but rather in what you have to know to read the text, or you have to take for granted to read the text. I'm talking about different kinds of knowledge, right? One makes an intellectual claim, and the other presumes that you understand something in a rather different way. As I said, we start with the time, 1079. The process, he comes across, a in the process of airing his paintings, he comes across a painting of bamboo, done by Wan Tung, one of his dearest friends who just died earlier that year. And the prose essay is called An Account of Wan Tung's Painting on the recumbent, of the Recumbent Bamboo in Yundang Valley. It starts with a grand claim, which you see, read the first part here. Intellectual historians, always, art historians, always focus on the first part. They do not read the second part. Why should it? The second part is all jokes. The first part is serious. It's what Guo Xue wants. The second part is silly. But somehow, if you read a, a text that starts with bamboo in the breast and end up in the end with somebody spitting bamboo shoots out on a table, you know that that other part, the bamboo in the belly, goes along with the bamboo in the breast, and you have to figure out what to do with the bamboo in the belly. <laughs> right? Now, here the opening goes. When the bamboo is first born, it's just a sprout of an inch, yet the segments and leaves are complete in it. Going from a cicada or a snake molting to reach up 10 yards, like a sword held upright, is something that it has from birth. Nowadays, painters do it segment by segment, burden it with leaf after leaf. How can this still be a bamboo? Now, Sudung Kuo invokes neither the ideal of a fully grown bamboo, nor the mimesis of any actual bamboo in the world. This is not about an idea of bamboo or a picture of bamboo you're looking at. This is bamboo as an organism that grows. And I don't know how to paint a growing organism. That's a very strange power, right? The bamboo, all the parts are complete in the beginning of the bamboo, but it has the propensity to grow and extend. Please forgive me if I think of the bamboo as capital. You know, you have a certain amount of money and you invest it and it keeps growing and growing and growing. This is actually very important for the last part of the thing. The bamboo is an inch in, and we all know that the mind is Fang Cuan, right? The mind is, a, so the bamboo fits, the baby bamboo fits exactly in the mind. <laughs> Hard to miss that. It has the propensity to grow beyond the mind out onto paper or silk, or to grow out into the world, or maybe into a lot of money. We'll tell you, talk about that. It's easy to paint the static bamboo or any particular bamboo in the world. It's hard to paint an organism. And we go on with the famous simile of the act of painting. I use Michael Fuller's translation, which I will give not here, but I'll give you the original text. Thus, to paint bamboo, one must fully first obtain a complete one in one's breast. There's your Cheng Yu, right? We all love our Cheng Yu. One grasps the brush and looks thoroughly. Then, when one has seen what one wants to paint, one rises rapidly to follow it, moving the brush in direct pursuit to close upon what one has seen. It's like a rabbit starting as a hawk dives, a little looseness of concentration, and the rabbit gets away. This is what Wan Tung told me. Although I knew the nature of bamboo, uh, I knew the nature of bamboo, I could not convey it to paper. Now when one knows an object's nature but cannot achieve it, the true effect, inner and outer, are not one. The mind and the hand are not mutually responsive. This is the result of not studying. 
If one is not well practiced in grasping whatever one has noted within, what one ordinarily fully comprehends will suddenly be lost at the crucial moment. That is, one tongue told me how to paint bamboo. I understand he's right. I just can't do it. We'll see later that it's problematic. It's a striking passage. And it illustrates the 11th century interest in spontaneity, or Fuller's better word, immediacy, things you do just spontaneously. It's an easy, comfortable argument, predictable profundity. Indeed, the majority of those who comment on the piece go no further than this passage. It is serious, or at least pretends to be. Much of the rest of the essay, as I said, consists of jokes added to it. Now, the disposition of a literary, literary scholar is in those precisely those texts with peculiar links and homologies. And as I said, when you have bamboo in the breast and bamboo being spit out on the table, you just try to figure, well, how does that work? We know when we read that, that Su Dung Po is playing. And I'll tell you something, I know Su Dung Po well enough to know that when he's playing, he's trying to deal with a very, very difficult problem. He doesn't play otherwise. Now, there's something wrong here with the authoritative lesson, offering, offering, offering reflective knowledge or, of mastery that's not characteristic for one tone in the rest of the essay. There's something wrong with a lesson that Su Dung Po can understand but not himself do it. This suggests Huil Luan Bien, Huil Rai Bien, who knows how to make a wheel but can't teach anybody. And that's actually used later on, the, the metaphor of Huil Luan Bien. So Su Dung Po can understand, but he can't do it. It troubles me that bamboo is an organic growing thing, but the one Tung uses a hunting metaphor. This may remind us of Wan Tung's roasted bamboo shoots, but it also recalls one of the most famous passages in Zhuangzi, the end of Wai Wu. Everyone knows most of this passage. Let's see if I can get to the next passage. Oh, yeah. So you all know this, right? The fish trap exists because of the fish. Once you've gotten the fish, you can forget the trap. The rabbit snare exists because of the rabbit. Once you've gotten the rabbit, you can forget the snare. Words exist because of the meaning. Once you've gotten the meaning, you can forget the words. Everyone takes this seriously. I'm not sure Zhuangzi took it seriously because you see the most famous you know, conclusion to that, which is, where can I find a man who's forgotten words so that I can have a word with him? So that while the first part tries to say, get the meaning and shut up, Zhuangzi says, keep talking. This is very common in Zhuangzi where he says something and then unsays it at the end. It's not difficult. It's very simple Chinese, quite clear. Yet it's consistently overlooked, except for the attempt to explain it, which just doesn't do deal with the real thing. And Zhuangzi often used figures of death and deadliness, traps, snares, for the loss of naturalness, not for good things. Right? Killing and consuming, leaving things in silence. But Zhuangzi always repopulates the silence with laughter. The question is, how do we know when an author is teasing us? Is Zhuangzi teasing us? Is Su Dong Po teasing us? I don't know. What do we do with a text that begins with an image of organic growth, then shifts suddenly to an image of hunting and killing? Well, we look for clues if something is wrong. Su Ding Po goes on to quote his younger brother, who wrote a Fu on Wan Tong's ink painting. Let me just get to that one. Oh, yes. My brother, Su Che, wrote a poetic exposition of, on painting, ink painting of bamboo and sent it to one tongue. It said, Butcher Ding was someone who cut apart oxen. Yet those who would nurture life learned something from him. Huil Rai Bien was someone who cut wheels. Yet the one who was reading agreed with him. You, sir, have invested such an idea in these bamboo. Yet would anyone disagree if I think you possess the way? Ziyo never practiced painting. as his brother Ziyo, Su Cha. He simply got the idea. 
As for myself, I didn't just get the ideas, says Su Shi, Su Lung Po. I got the method for painting. Now, if you know Chinese, you know this is wrong. You're supposed to say, he just got the method for painting. I got the way. So when Su Shi turns that around and says, we both got the way, but he got, I got the method for painting. And he can't, of course, did he get the method for painting? He tells us himself he can't do it. Okay, at this point we should realize that this is a hopeless muddle. And the source of the muddle is the paradox of intuitive immediacy of spontaneity. Wan Tung has tried to transmit into Sudampo in words his talent in ink bamboo. In Bien, in Luen Bien's terms, this is the dregs of painting bamboo. Now, I think Su Dong Po is winking at us. He maybe has even, even been putting us on. He's been using the high rhetoric of art theory and the great issues of the day, immediacy. These are really important issues in the period. And the intellectual historians take it for the bait. But all of a sudden, he drops that discourse entirely. And we get to Wan Tung number two. We saw Wan Tung number one, right? He's the guy that gives you the profound lesson. Now one tongue number two. Um, and all of a sudden, you see a different one tongue. OK. When you cut, that's one tongue. Began, first painted bamboo. He didn't take what he was doing seriously. I think the English term here, for those of you who are, is doodling. He's doodling. He's saying, uh, like that. He's not even thinking about it. People carrying plain silk came from every direction to ask for painting and would line up toe to heel at his gate. One Tung was sick of this and threw his paintings on the ground, cursing, I'm going to make socks out of these. Gentlemen, pass this around as a good anecdote. Instead of Wan Tung, the theorist here, who would teach others how to paint bamboo, here we see Wan Tung as essentially a doodler. He did not take his art seriously. Bu zi gui zhong, right? It would, he was, I think, in the condition of a truly spontaneous, unselfconscious painter, right? That's a unselfconscious painter cannot know what he is doing, right? If you say, I want to paint, not Zuran to painting, not unselfconscious, you can't do it. You can only do it when you don't know you're doing it. This is an old problem of romantic theory in the West. Okay. But if people are lining up saying, would you paint me an unselfconscious painting? I have a piece of silk. And you have a whole line of these people, all who are saying, please paint me a natural, spontaneous, unselfconscious painting. What's happening in the world, right? Those people who want him to paint an unselfconscious painting all value unselfconsciousness, right? And the horrible thing is, and this is Professor Sheba's area, when there is an intellectual value becomes a social value, it also becomes a commercial value. So there's all the, and you know those people bringing silk, you know what they're bringing him, don't you? They're bringing him not just enough silk to paint a bamboo on, they're bringing him a lot of silk to paint a smaller bamboo on. Silk is money. You can get rich this way. So here the poor unselfconscious painter gets mad because all these people are trying to get him to paint unselfconscious bamboo, he has to throw his paintings on the ground and stomp on them and say, make socks out of them. And they say, oh, what a wonderful, eccentric, unselfconscious man. And the value of his paintings go up even more. You can't get away from them. Those people who want his paintings are there, always there, staring at him saying, please paint another unselfconscious painting for me. They can go sell it for more money than they spent. Right? So, we have a queue of gentry. Wantung tries to break free. 
He has his fit, and it just makes him even more and more interesting. I won't go into every detail in the text, but one tongue does, how does he, poor one tongue get out of this, right? He hates it. How can you escape when people have suddenly decided you're an unselfconscious genius? Well, there's no good Chinese tradition that helps him escape. You can pass on your art to a disciple. And guess who gets it? Let's see if it's in this thing, yeah. Oh no, that's not it. It's back there. No, this, wait a minute, we got. Oh, I didn't. Anyway, I guess maybe I left that. Did I leave that out? Uh, I don't know. In any case, what happens is he decides, he says, go find Su Dong Po. He's, my, he's the new master. I'm retired. And that's the, you know, so he manages to escape the people, and they all go to poor Su Dong Po. Okay, so once the issue of commercialism has entered into this world of art theory, you can't get rid of it. You can't erase it anymore, right? Bamboo begins as an inch-long sprout in the ground or in the mind. It has a sure, a propensity to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. It's super bamboo, big bamboo. Sudamu thinks of the material medium of representation, the silk. And when the increase in size of the representation is also an increase in money. The bigger the, bigger the bamboo painting, the more money the silk is worth, right? And he begins a joke again. I think this is uh, somewhere up here. Yep. So he sends, he sends it back and he says, at the end of the letter, he copies a letter out, and one tongue copied out a poem that said in excerpt, I plan to take this piece of Goose Creek silk, Goose Creek silk and sweep forth wintry stalks 10,000 feet long. And I told, this is Sudung Po speaking, I told one tone, if you're going to have bamboo 10,000 feet tall, you're going to need 250 bolts of silk. I realize that you're going to wear yourself out with brush and inkstone, that is painting, simply for your desire to get so much silk. That is, Sudung Po is playfully accusing Wan Tong, our unselfconscious doodler, of doing painting to get, make money. Wan Tong's grand, grand intention to paint the fully realized bamboo 10,000 feet tall becomes the silent desire to get rich. Right? The two friends, older and younger, have descended to witty banter with Su Shur as the unchallenged wit of his age and the master of all banter. Poor Wan Tung, when he gets Su Shur's joke, he says he can't deal with it. Wan Tung couldn't make a good retort. Let me go on here. Now, we da, he couldn't answer him. He said, I was wrong. How could there ever be bamboo 10,000 feet tall? I followed up on this. Su Dung Po is a pretty vain guy, you know. He says, I followed up this, offered a complete concrete example of how you could, answering his poem. In this world, there are indeed bamboo 10,000 yards tall. When the moon sets in the empty courtyard, the shadows are just that long. One tongue laughed and said, Su Shu really can make a witty case. Still, with 250 bolts of silk, I could, I could buy fields and retire. So you see him start, they're, they're talking about making money. And one tongue is saying, can I really make that much money? Maybe I can. Maybe I can get rich. You can't, you know, no one man can say that, right? But little old, simply an old man thinking about making enough money to buy a farm. Um, then he said to me, recumbent bamboo of Yundang sent me, recumbent bamboo of Yundang Valley that he had painted, commenting, these bamboos are just several feet long, but they have the propensity, sure, to become 10,000 feet tall. Now what Su Dong Po has done is he's infected the discourse with fantasies of wealth. Su Dong Po's couplet is a bit strained, but the figure of bamboo growing to ever taller as dark shadows uncannily echoes the 
dark shadows of bamboo on the moon, in the moonlight. The inch of bamboo in the mine has grown to any imagined height on white silk. This is propensity, sure, of bamboo to grow tall. Wontung's disavowal of his fantasy in increase collapses before Sucher's affirmation. At this point, Wontung starts thinking of making enough money to retire with his doodling. So Wontung, the one-time doodler, has now brought up a fantasy of a 250 bolts of silk and the possibility of buying a retirement home. This is the Song Dynasty. This is not the Tang Dynasty. Right? You can't get that money out of their minds. Um, the elite disdain commerce, professed, professed, loft, professed lofty ideals, but the realities of commerce and economic life, about a Professor Shiba, <laughs> is right there behind everything. Um, and in this next poem, Sushu will grow one tongue's imaginary capital to significant wealth. All this banter was the occasion for this particular painting that Sushur has unrolled for his autumn airing. Wantung has found his retort, and Sushur duly records it in the same, there's the same principle with which Sushur opened his essay. Although the bamboo suit is small, indeed small enough to fit into the inch of the mind, it can really grow to huge heights, right? That's why I said, I think this is the Warren Buffett of bamboo for those of you who, you know, this is the person to invest on in a little tiny bamboo shoot, and it makes a huge, vast bamboo shoot uh, on, on silk, which turns into a lot of money, right? Sure, the, tech, the propensity of small things to increase. Now, Yundang Valley was in Yangzhou, where Wantung once served, and he commissioned me to write 30 verses on Yangzhou, one of which was to be on Yundang Valley. My poem went, and I think, let's see if I've got this over here. Yeah. No, no, this, this is the back of the old one. I can't see it, yeah. Uh, and I might be leaving pieces out here. The tall bamboo of the river Han are cheap as dandelions. Whenever did this had the hatchet spare these Ashis dragons? I reckon that these feed the governor in his austere poverty. The governor is one tongue. But a thousand acres of way shore are in his breast. Okay, that breast which had the one bamboo in it, I gotta stay here what the sound system is, now becomes the famous bamboo that filled the shores of the Wei River near Chang'an, which the great historian Sima Chen tells us is that money enough has, provides money enough to live like a prince. So this is in his breast. Not just bamboo, but many bamboo that become a lot of money. On that day, Wan Tung was visiting the valley with his wife, and they were roasting bamboo shoots for their evening meal. When he opened the letter packet and found this poem, he was so overcome with laughter that he spit out his food all over the table. So that's what happens to the bamboo, right? The bamboo, the bamboo fantasy of the mind becomes the bamboo sh spit out all over the table. The noble bamboo, right, was a signifying plant whose image invited contemplation. It was referred to poetically as Tzu Jun, this gentleman. Right? And famous for its integrity, Jie. Also the segmented joints of a bamboo, and for its perseverance, staying green through the winter. All these good, noble things of bamboo. And also, it's a delicious vegetable. Now, how you get a vegetable that has integrity, I don't know, but that's anyway. Uh, it's difficult to explain a thousand-year-old joke, but Su Shur's poem is very funny. The question of commercial value is part of the joke. Jian, translated as cheap, and everyone knows bamboo shoots are cheap in their season, is also the class term base. 
the very opposite of Ci Jin, Jian Min, right? At first, we may not know why they're being cut indiscriminately with a hatchet. Bamboo has many uses. When we see sheared dragons, we know these are bamboo shoots. Dragons can contract into something very small, but they extend out into vast distances. Dragons can, um, when there are still shoots, bamboo have pur purpley sheaths that are shed as the bamboo grows. So the governor, Wan Tong, lives in noble poverty and eats cheap bamboo shoots, jian, right? But in his breast is Tsujun, the bamboo in his breast, and he has the thousand, which is, turns into money, which gives him the thousand acres of bamboo by the way river. He becomes a rich man. Roughly speaking, you live in poverty, you eat the cheapest and most humble of foods, but in your heart is the bamboo, which is both a dream of wealth and that inch-long sprout that grows into the painting that which brings you more silk. Su Shi's poem chances to reach Wan Tong when he's having dinner. Chinese would say, this is definitely chow. It's the right moment when you find suddenly the bamboo shows up at, at the dinner table. And once the bamboo begins as a bamboo shoot in the breast, it comes at last, the bamboo shoots in the stomach. The former, the bamboo shoots in the breast go to maturity. At exactly the right moment emerge through the hand of the artist. Okay. The bamboo shoots in the tummy. We're there until you tell a good joke which has to do with making money, and then they become the bamboo shoots on the table. The former belongs to the artist, who does not know he's an artist. The latter belongs to the governor, who lives simply and in poverty, who thinks of making socks out of his paintings and eats roasted bamboo shoots. What are we to make of this? As grand as the first part is, it's hard not to feel that such a mode of Offering a grand theory of art has somehow been superseded by the homier truth of the latter part. He left a lesson, E, for his readers, who wanted to die or Wang Yan, but those readers will continue reading to something richer. Rather than the question of immediacy in the opening passage, here we see its impossibility. We see Wan Tung as a doodler with pure unself consciousness that has no sense of value in either the unselfconsciousness nor in the painting of the product. But already we're in an age which values immediacy. And whether one tongue likes it or not, he has no power in this world, social world he finds himself in. Whether he likes it or not, that become the aesthetic value has become social value, which is commercial value, and you can't ever get away from it. All this is set in the context of death and remembrance. On the 20th day of the first month of the second year of the Yuan Fang reign, Wan Tong passed away in Chengzhou. On the seventh day of the seventh month that year, I was in Huzhou, was airing my books and paintings. I saw these bamboo, I put aside the scroll, choked with tears. Long ago, Cao Cao, sacrificial address to Chao Xuan, Use the phrases, the carriage pass, and I felt a pain in the belly. Here's that belly again. And these playful words I wrote earlier for one to show my feeling of perfect closeness with him. We come at last to the occasion for writing this autumn piece, the air, autumn airing of the scrolls. He hadn't been thinking of one to initially, but seeing the painting made him trace back the meaning and all that was behind it and then finally the pain of death and loss. As Chinese readers so often did, Su Po looks to the past of what, for examples of what happened. Su Po thinks of the great warlord Cao Cao at the end of the Han. Xiao Xuan was the man who first told Cao Cao that he was a genius and could rule the empire. Just like Wan Tong was the person who passed the art of bamboo painting on to Su Po. He can't forget about the, he the, the feels a pain in the belly and you can't forget about the bamboo shoots. I began by talking about the nature of knowledge, embodied literary texts. 
It's clearly not the kind of knowledge offered in Wontung's lesson about knowing the moment to strike. Perhaps the best way to approach it is knowledge that we must presume in the reader in order for him or her to make sense or see the humor of the text. That's a special kind of historical knowledge in which we suddenly realize they know what we know. They can claim the values of immediacy, but they know the real complications of the world, how things are embedded in social relationships, in which those values, like immediacy, work only imperfectly. So I'm stepping back for a bit of reflection on the process, and I'm going to get out of here before it's time, I hope. We started off with a standard Chinese studies reading of the opening passage. And it sounds very wonderful image of the hawk striking and the rabbit. The nature of knowledge within the text also is the nature of knowledge assumed in the discussion. It requires an authoritative master, and it will not change. Wan Tung's authoritative lesson on painting is a variation on conventional values. In the background is the assumption of a long phase of practice after which a mastery is achieved. That mastery justifies the lesson given to Sudung Po. There is no hint of such mastery in the next section. The stage of mastery involves the internalization of values to the degree that action is pre-reflective. Confucius in 70. That belongs, so you can trace the Guo Xue thing right back to the beginning of Chinese culture. That gives it a kind of pedigree and authenticity a kind of weight, it becomes a chung yu. And that's good, you see. What I realized is you need both of these. You can't do the new without speaking the old. And speaking the old without doing the new is hollow. So the two have to go together. They may not fit together, but they have to go together. And this happens over and over again in Chinese discourse. That's why I think it's very interesting. To reach the representation of the fallible human being, Sutra has to go through standard values to show something beyond them. The standard values are not false, but they're not adequate by themselves. So we come at last to a way to think about how pre-modern China could both be continuing, you know, the, the old thing if you work teach a Chinese and teach literature, you know that there's always somebody in the audience who will say, this is not a new idea, this is a very old idea. And we'll go back and give you a text beforehand, and somebody else will go back and say, it's even earlier than that. And you believe that all knowledge already existed at the beginning of time, which may be true. So on the one side is the Gorshia notion of this China which is eternal and which continually recycles and nuances ideas. On the other side is something we can really recognize as progress. Because that idea of the bamboo that you add selling bamboo and you know, it becomes a commercial value that you can't escape from, that's very sophisticated. I don't think you could say it any other way except as an assumption. You can tell a story, but that is no less knowledge. Because without that knowledge, you can't read the poems, you can't read the prose section. It makes no sense at all. So those two pieces, both the tradition and the innovation seem bound together and have to live together side by side. Thank you. And 48 seconds left to go. Okay. Okay. Professor Yoshinobu Shiba distinguishes himself as one of the most intelligent and insightful scholars in Song Dynasty history, particularly with a concentration on the commercial, economic, and the social interactions. His work has um, beautifully demonstrated this integration of uh, different kind of uh, trainings altogether. And particularly, his uh, training in Japanese sinological studies, his uh, understanding of a methodology strong from Western social sciences, and his uh, excellent immersion in Chinese archival studies. 
by putting all the three different disciplines together, he managed to explore a new and extremely different world of the dynamics of a Song Dynasty in every aspect. His study is truly interdisciplinary and cross-cultural. Professor Shiba's concentration is not merely on Song Dynasty social ed and economic history. He is equally an expert in urban history of a pre-modern China. And above all, in recent decades, he also dedicated himself to the studies of overseas Chinese. And in that capacity, he actually has done research um, on this island in connection with the old city, Tainan. So in that sense, I think uh, Professor Shiva truly has an intimate ties to our society and our cultural circle. Sibu Yixin Jiaoshou, his research is in Song Dynasty and social history. 但是除了这两项专长之外呢，他对于整个的中国从宋代以后不同时期的经济社会以及都市变化呢，都有精深的研究。那么在过去这些年呢，他对于华侨作为一种特殊的中国在海外的个别或是群体的身份呢，也有许多专精而独到的见解。那么，斯波伊辛教授所呈现的一种汉学研究呢，真正是跨领域、跨学科的。所以在今天呢，我们非常难得的有机会请到斯波伊辛教授，那么来做专题的演讲。Professor Shiba's topic for today is、uh, 中国史上的商人的社会位置 ，the social position of the merchant in Chinese history. Now, may I have the honor to invite Professor Shiba to give us his lecture. Thank you. Thank you. So, then, Chinese history of the social position. 報告をさせていただきます。私は中国語はできませんので、日本語であの報告をさせていただきます。失礼いたします。私がこれまで大学院時代から行ってきた研究の焦点は、闘争変革期における社会変動について、広く言えば。まず、一、中国史の悠久の経過の中で、社会構造の刷新をきたすような全面的な変動が果たしてあったのがいなかった、言い換えれば、中国の歴史の流れを政治的、社会的秩序の清水、調和の回復の連鎖としてよりも、むしろ社会全体の動態史、ダイナミズムとして、考察することはできるか否かという関心でありました。より具体的に申せば、今、さらに、まあ、こうした動態変化を起こさせる要素は結局何であったのか、でその因果の連関について、資料に即して実証できるかどうかという問題に興味がありました。私はその研究作業上の仮説として、交通と社会分業、社会分業とは、ソーシャル・レビジョン・ノブ・レイブのことです、それから社会移動、ソーシャル・モビリティ、それから都市化、つまりアーバリゼーションという切り口を用意しまして、この問題に取り組んでまいりました。で大学院で勉強しておりましたころ、すでに日本の二三の先輩が、闘争変革、闘争の変革期というものについて、興味深い洞察を下しておりました。その一人は内藤コナン、それからその、これを後継、あと、あと、これを
さらに発展させました宮崎一田さんという2人の先輩です。両方とも京都大学の学者です。それからその次に、えー、あの桑原実像という、うん、先生がいます。この桑原先生は桑原、まあ、あのまあ、フランス文学の桑原先生のお父様ですが、ルードヴィッヒ・リースの直接の弟子で、リースという人はド,ドイツのベルリン大学の地理学の先生で、そして日本に1778年から1905年まで滞在して、近代的な歴史学を教えた人です。いわゆる親と以外国人。で、この方に直接学んだのが桑原先生で、その考え方には、地理学の影響が非常に強いです。で、私の商業研究の中で、最も大きな影響を受けた方です。でそこであの、まあ、こういう商人の社会的地位をめぐる、まあ、通念とか社会環境とは、えー、いかなる関係きっかけがあって、まあ、昔から変遷したかそしてあの商人がドライビングフォースといいますか社会変化の原動力となるというのは中国史のあのにおける商人の地位についての常識から言いますと誠に変わった話でありますそこで若干の説明が必要だと思いますのでまず市民の説ということからお話ししてまいりたいと思いますあそれから失礼しましたあの加藤茂氏という先生は東京大学の先生でもともと臨時台湾休館調査会、ね、南満州鉄道株式会社の事業ですがそういう観光調査という法律と慣習との関わり方を調べられるそれから後に新国行政法というまあ中国の行政のマニュアルを同じく臨時台湾休館調査会で研究されてそして、まあ、結局中国の歴史書を詳しく読み正確に読むことによって経,社会経済史を開拓することができるという方法を編み出された人です。それかで今次に移ります。ハンコが編纂した感情という聖書の中に、死の交渉という食の別の社会序列があって、その中では脳が本業として最も尊ばれるほか、証拠は必要ではあるけれども差別された。社会,社会の階層であると記しているおりますこの市民の説というのはさらに古くは紀元前7世紀頃山東省の清の人漢中の作品だと言われております漢主という書士百科の本にも問われておりまして、えー、これはあの清という国の王様であった漢光が漢市民をどのように住、ま、の住居に迫らせたらよいかということを諮問したときに答えた漢中の,あの言葉です。で、市の交渉の市民というのは国の責任であると、責任というのは基礎、柱という意味なんです。で,ですから、まあ、これはこの,この時はですね、市の交渉、いずれも
あの国を作り上げている大事な社会階層なんだとそういう認識を下しているわけです。でだ,だからそれぞれを住まわせるということについては市については学校に市を集めて審議に先進させてさせるべきであると。それから農の場合は田や田畑に集中させるべきだし、公というのは、これは国の手工業を受け持つわけですから、役所の近くに住まわせて、そしてその技術は府警からあの、えー、この子どもたちに伝習させると。それから省の場合は商人はこれは市政に宗教させてこのマーケットがあったかないかということは疑問ですけどまずこの頃はなかったというのが通説なんですね。でまあこの施政と言っているのは辺境にあった貿易の場所のことを言っていると思います。で府警から商業の技術を伝授させるべきだと。で要するに世襲の技術をがいかんなく発揮できるように、住居を分けて、それぞれ職能に先進させるのが一番いい方策だというふうに提案しています。で、これを見ると、あのこれはですね、ま,あのまたその同じ文章で、朝廷および礼儀が尊敬されるためには、徴用、権具、規制などの階層ごとの秩序が守,、ね、守られることが大事であった。もしこうした秩序、区別が守られずに、階層ごとに許されている社種の限度も犯す,すようであれば、多密な知能交渉からなる市民が営む世襲の権利、義務、生活様式がすべて乱れて、政府に対する尊敬が失われるというふうにしております。これがまあ一番早い市民の説、漢中の説であります。で、あのシカゴ大学の加平太教授はこの社,社会移動のことについて優れた本をお書きになったんですが、その中でこうした言説が現れた背景は何かというふうに解説を下しておられまして、古代において理想的であるあり。かつ権威のある政治社会は西の州、青州の制度であって、それは封建制であると、で漢中の時代には、その封建制はもうすでに崩壊の兆しに差し掛かっていました。で西の州は771年、紀元前771年に滅びますから。もうこの7世紀にはかなり乱れているということは言えると思います。それで、その崩壊の兆しの中で、一つは支配種族の長男、長子による家督や財産の相続、それから生まれついての階層差別に基づいて組織されてきた、いわゆる封建の社会秩序。この中に市民も入るんですが、が時代の数勢として危機に変するという、これ、現実や意識が確実に一方に存在したと、でまたその一方でこうし、このように矛盾や不平等がすでに明らかな古い社会を放置しておけば、国の存立が保障できない、危ない、で解決のための方策や提案を緊急に講ずる必要があるというのは、諸子百科のあのいろいろな説のもとであって、結局、この,この二律背反、一方では国や社会が乱れていると、一方ではその乱れた社会は長,長続きできないという、そういう問題に対する回答を、諸子白化は出していたんだということになると思います。それで自家はどう
どういったかと言いますと、特にまあ申しですが、人の生まれついての才能は元来、人ごとに不平等なのだから、えー、金持ちと貧乏、それから、えー、能力のある人、ない人の別によって、自然に社会の階層化が生ずることはこやむを得ないと、こういう判断ですね。そこで各人のあのまあ、工業、功績、アチーブ、アチーブメンツをオープンで普遍的な方法で査定して、そのアチーブメンツの達成度や優劣を、例えば教育の機会を増やすことで、選抜をし、そして客観的に判定した上で、そこの、その、手続きを経て、まず学者を選び、でその学者を市と言います、市の中から官、つまりやお役人ですが、を任命すればよいというふうな解釈ですね、これはまあ、あの州のそ、そして教育の普及を土台として、平等な階層社会を創出することを提唱しております。これはあの中国でとことさらあの教育が重んじられるということの。そそもそもの,あの起こりだと思いますでどうか、正反対の立場はどうかでありまして、どうかは万物は哲学的に見れば平等なので、人も毛玉も木も石も、それぞれ本,然本然の性をに従って生きる限りは、高い、低い、正しい、間違い、対象、強弱という、そういう差別というものは本来生じないんだと。というふうにしております。で、したがって人為的、道徳的なあの強制、強制を、まあ、むしろ否定している、つまり、無意にして勝つ、つまり、do nothing という考え方を主張しているわけです。それで、ところで、あの、青州の時代に、青州とは西の州ですね。の時代には、種族制、時代はですね、種族、クランシステムの時代でありますから、まあ、ありまして、政治の統合秩序とか集落の秩序から言いますと、そのパターンというのは、まあ、U、あの E、つまり、城郭都市を,を単位となった、あの、まあ、石戸都市国家の、あの連盟の状態というふうに考えてもいいと思います。そこで、えー、そのこの城郭,城郭都市、つまり支配士族が住んでいた集落の単位ですが、その優と優との中間地帯はどうであったか。でこれは種族狩猟とか遊牧を目的とする人たちのが住んでいる粗法な地域であって、これを伝とか漁とかいうし、あるいはあの山,山,山、川、藪、沢といったような、まあ、農業に向かない土地であるというふうに関連されていまして、この当時は、遊牧民とか狩猟民とか漁業民、えー、森林に住む人たち、これは広告の民、広告というのは、行くという字と国、つまり移動,に移動して定住でしていない民というものに数えられていまして、えー、漢族は城の中であの住んでおり、これは定住民です。でそのために、この今、市民と言われる中の農民ですね、農というのは、これはすでに農耕民としてすでに存在したとは思いますけれども、城郭内に住むというよりは、城の近く、近郊、あるいは俗有、小さな城郭都市の中に住んで、社会地位もまあ農土に近い状況だったというので、後世のように、あの独立した農民がそ,そ,そこら中に住んでいてですね、それをああの考えて
昨日と言っているのではないと私は思います。それから、城郭の中には支配種族とその家族、それから青銅器や国旗、木旗などを製造する施工業者が多数いる、これ,はこ,れこそは、まあ、その国が成り立つための非常に大事な要素であります。でその地位はまあ奴隷に近いものだったと思いますが、そのほかに商人、商業もまあこ,のこの当時の国を成り立たせるためには必要な存在でありまして、ね、つまり都市国家なんですから、それは必要な存在であると、そして城郭内には、後世、まあ、つまり深夜官員の時代以後のような政府のコントロールスイッチと。いうものはあったかとは思いませんけれども、その、えー、国境で御死亡役が行われておりましたから、商人はそう,いうそうしたところに集まったというふうに考えております。で、まあ、つまり、漢中が言っている市民というのは、あのこの封建制度の中で、世襲的で、はい、あの親からの商,商業を守って、自分の役目を果たすという、そういうタイプの職業文化のことを言っておりまして、えーまあ、商工業者というのは、国や支配民族の、士族の、存立ために不可必要不可欠な存在であります、責任というんですから、その限りで活動を認められていたわけですけれども、あのえー、例えば、漢の時代の芝線の式の過食列伝などを見ますと、す、う、で、ん、に、えー、都市国家の時代から、商業者の活動というものは記録の中に残っております。例えば、いにしえのかの王,王朝の民というものは、商業の技術に優れていて、その子孫が関内の都市にも住んでいたということは、そこに伝わっあの記録されております。また、柴さんによりますと、巨万の富を築いたと。でもこの一方で、世襲で、世襲の制度の下で、あの親代々の職業をしていたと言われているこの時代にですね、あの実はあれいくつかの有名な大商人の例があったわけです。それは、例えば、先ほど出ました漢中という人は、あの清の国の、うん大夫というのは、士族長ですけれども、奉仕区がと一緒に商売をして、えー、河南省の南洋まで行って商売をしたと、それから越という国の大将の藩令はですね、あの東北という国に行って、えー、名前を東志公と変えまして、そして10年の間に3度も千金に上る。利益を上げたという話がありますまた、ロノ国にはイトンという大商人がいました、まあ、そういう話がありますから、あの市,民の市民制度のもとに、商人の地位が非常に低かったと言ってもです、ね、それはあの制度そのもののことを言っているわけであって、現実にあの商業行為が行われておって、そこから大きな利益を上げる人たちがいたことは間違いなく言えると思います。で、時間がありませんので、次の話に移ります。交通と社会分業と。えー、で、中国史の中で、あの社会で生きる。庶民の日常生活に変動を引き起こしたような技術変化としては、まあ、いろいろあるんですが、私は中んづく交通、通信の変化というものに注目したいと思います。で
近代的な交通技術が中国にもたらされたのは19世紀でありまして、えー、あの無線電信とか蒸気船それから汽船汽車そういったものが交通の大革命を引き起こしたわけです。でそれ以前ではどうであったかということになりますと随,の随等の時に行われた水運それから海運海の海運そうですね海運における変革の意義というものはあの技術変化の中では非常に大きかったというふうに思います。で随の610年に大運河が完成しまして。海放落葉から甲州、忍法まで水運が全国に通じました。で、これと並行して首都を起点としてあの時計回りにですね、大体8本の基本の路線ができまして、そういう交通のネットワークというものは基本的に整ったということをまず指摘できると思います。そこで問題は2つありますその交通が発達した結果、商品といいますか、地方の資源の特産化が進んだということですね。でこれは資源、その特産物が登場すれば、商品が当然起こってくるという、そういう自然の現象です。第2はですね、この交通の発達と商業の発達というものを、せ国家が、この問題に適応して、そして大きな変革をしている、これは中国史でもこの時期が初めてなんですが、あの中国が北方から遊牧民族が侵入すると、これに対抗して、軍隊を作るときにです、ね、まあ、古代からというか、清、漢の時代から随、唐まで一貫して、じゃあ基本的な方針は、農民歩兵を養成するということです。これに、この問題からですね、この党の半ばを過ぎますと、あのちょうど起こってきた水運、海運という、交通の改革と、またその、商業活動の,僕があの勢力を、まあ、利用して、まあ、言えば合弁の形で、えー、それを国家がその商業交通商業の発達をにうまく適応して、えー、新しい軍事制度にを作り上げたとということですそれは7世, 7世紀頃からあのその背景としてどういう水運が起こったかと申しますと当の7世紀頃ですね政府が省税を施行するというあの案が出てきましたでこれに対して左右という官僚がそういった文章をこ,の、えー、ここに挙げております。これを見ますと、あの水運がです、ね、全部つながっているという、これ非常に大事なことなんですが、あの水門とか、席とか、水位を調節する装置があって、黄河から落,落水、そして南の大運河を通って、南方の四つ港の、につながる支流とかいくつかの川はですね、すべてをつながってるんだというふうにこの議論してるんです、ね。それでそのだから大運は大運がだけの発展じゃなくて、その大運河を,を含めて河北河中河南の水運はまああの一つの一体となっている。そして、そういう労働者が起こり、そういう業者が起こっている、だから
もし、せおぜをかければです、ね、その水分業者の利益が減り、そして労働者の反乱が起こると、そういう、まあ、物騒なことが起こるんではないかというふうに、えー、そんなところ、観点から反対をしています。それからもうその先ほど申しましたが、交通が起こるとどういうメリットがあるかというと、これはあの資源が地方にそれまでバラバラにあった資源が、あの交通の力によってです、ね、それぞれ地方ごとに特産化し、あのえー、それぞれの市場、市場、マーケットができてくると。いうことですでこれ地域間の交通の発達によって、まあ、で出稼ぎが多くなるということはもちろんですがその中で商人が活動しまして彼らは,はその地域の,の値段を差異によって設けるわけですから全国的な評判のある商品それから地域的に評判の高い商品をが揃ってくるとということがですねこれが商業活動の非常に大きな前提になっていることわけです。で、ここで交通の改良によって、まあ、そういう全国的規模で地域の特産物がの市場が広がったということは、これ、間違いのないことであろうと思います。それで、その次に、うんあの、特産物市場といいますが、地方ごとのあのまあ、名産物産のリストがです、ね、大体分かってきたということです。でここに挙げておりますのは、宋の時代の,あの都が解放というんですけれども、北宋の時代です、その時に全国的に見渡してです、ねこの、この商品はこれしかないと、右に出るものはないというふうに。したのがこの28ぐらいあるんですが、これ重要ですね、28で、それぞれ見てみると、なるほどと思うところがあるんです、でそれから後で、後で、総代には交通と商業を発達したために、広く需要され、消費される物資の中で、おのずからです、ね、全国的な評判の高い商品が出てきました。でシトロ解放の人、太平老人と人の,の随筆ですけれども、集中金という本があるんですが、その中に、天下第一というものを掲げております、これがここに挙げた28種類のものです。で、この中で面白いのは、みんな、家中、家南の特産物が非常に多いということなんですね。それから福建省の産物が結構この中に多い、例えば16番がそうですね、それから25番の福建秀才というのは、これは福建、秀才というのは、党の時代からあるんですけれども、家境の場合、試験で秀才化というものを受ける、でこれはあまり評判は高くはないんだけれども、合格はまあしやすいというか、それで福建の人はこの秀才化から、家境に入ったということがよく言われているんですね。それこれを社会移動というんですが、あのまあこういうことは後でお申し申し上げますから、あのこの程度にしておきますけれども、社会移動とは何かといえばですね、これはあの人材を輸出すると、で商売ですとその。地域の資源を輸出する、外地へ輸出して、まあ、収益を上げるということなんですね。それで、あのあのこの闘争時代に、ね、あの非常にこういう、まあ、交通が発達し、そして地方が特産化して、でその資源を。外資輸出するとそれは当然、商人の発達ということになってくるんですが、それからまあそれと合わせてです、ね、人材を外資に輸出して、地方の
、まあ、名誉を高めるということで非常に熱心だった、まあ、一種の社会心理なんですがそういうあの戦略を取った地方がいくつかあります。その中に福建地方がありますので、福建のことをちょっと詳しく申し上げたいと思います。それから、ここに書いておりますように、福建、民代までを視野に入れてみますと、この下京試験で成功して役人になれた、その成功率の高い地方とはどこかというと、これはちゃんと数が分かっているんでして、第1位は厚生省。ですね、それからその次は浙江省と、それから高層省、福建省と、まあ、福建省は 4, 4番目に入っておりますで、この言葉はあの、すでに祖母の時代から、あの例えば哲学者の趣旨なんかは、このことをすでに言っておるわけでして、まあ、あの一,一つ面白い。あの総代の役人の言葉でを挙げておきたいと思いますけれどもそれは例えばさっき大園先生が外場のことをお書きになったっていう装飾はあのこれ福,建の福建というところは海の商人で。を商売にしているとで福建を代表する職業は海上商業だというふうに言っていますこれは非常にあの面白いあの発言であって例えば日本と中国との貿易というのはあの唐の時代はいわゆる遣唐使ですが。遣唐使は初めは渤海湾に沿って島津大っていうかあの陸を見ながら行ったところが733年から頃からですねあの沖,縄で沖縄本島をちょっと過ぎたところからあの東シナ海を直接横切って忍法へ行くようになったんですねこれは理由はいろいろあるんですけどそれはで、ね、あのやはり中国側の商人がそういう海を直接渡ってあの日本とかあるいは朝鮮半島の小漁ですね小漁とあのそういうところと盛んに貿易してましたなぜかというとあの、えー、宋が始まるちょっと前に五代という時代があってその頃五越国という国、あるいは南,東南韓国とか、これは福建の方ですけども、それからあの、江南、南東国は盛んに海外貿易を行って、そしてそのあの国の富を上げました。でそのやり方はあのそしてまあ、あ,あともう時間が来ておりますから最後のところだけ読み上げますけども「装飾は福建一路解消を持っていようとする」というふうに述べてます。海,海運業こそは福建商業を代表する職業でして交通と分業の刺激のもとに福建が生み出した究極の地域ぐるみの,あの新しい職業でした。でこの勢いが順調にもし民代、新代と引き続いて発展しておれば、あるいは近代的な商業と、ちょうどあのイタリアにおけるベニスとかジェノアによく似ておるんですが、そういうようなケースで、例えば銀行業が起こるとか、海運業から大資本化が出てくるとか、まあ、そういうケースはです、ね、復権を基礎に起こったんではないかと。思っても別におかしくはないんですで、えー、そ,そういうわけでして交通と分業の発展がこのようにまずマーケットを広げますそれでマーケットを広げた上で経済的社会,社会的な環境条件が整ってく、えー、るということも非常に重要なんです
、でえー、そそれ先ほど申しましたが、軍事補給、プロビジョニングとか、ロジスティックスとか、そういうあの兵隊、うん、国の防衛に関わって、交通、それから商業をの力を国が借りて、まあ、合弁の形で営んだと。でこれはあのそういう特別な時代だったと、総代から民の全般まではです、ね、そういうロジスティックスというものがあの中で、商業、商事制度、例えば為替だとか、自衛制度とか、そういったものも発達するし、それからあのお茶とか塩とかですね、それから。あの香料などの専売をそのロジスティックスに組み込むとかそういう制度が盛んに行われたでしかし残念なことに民の初期にですねこの,あの海運、まあ、せっかく起こっていた総代の復権を中心とした海運業というのはあのまあ民の対その政策によってです、ね、あのえまあ貿易を抑圧されてそれからあと民の後半になると旋回令というものを、まあ、行われましてですねそしてせっかくなあの起こった動きというものは実を結ばなかったということは言えると思います。でしかしかもう終わって、もう読まなくていい、読まなくていい、もうちょっと、ちょうど時間になってまいりましたので、私のお話も十分申し上げられなかったんですけれども、大体、交通が発達し、分業が発達してですね、そして経済体制、そういう社会心理、あのあの自然の資源を輸出する、それから人材を輸出するということが、一つの地方の,あの方針となって、そして、まあ、今言いましたの福建なら福建、浙江省とか、そういう地方独特の文化が発達したということが、あの私の申し上げたいところであります。どうううも失礼いいたたしましまありがとうございます Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we just listened to two very, very、um, illuminating lectures. One on the art and,、uh, and the value of bamboo in terms of、uh, multiple perspectives of artistic understanding and undertaking,、uh, friendship, and of course,、uh, bamboo as the motif of a traditional Chinese painting. And the other one、uh, deals with the genealogy of the merchant, particularly focusing on the Song Dynasty. Amazingly, the two lectures are actually related to each other, not only focusing upon the Song Dynasty,、um, the social, economic, and the cultural interrelated relationships, but also that demonstrated how、um, Sinology really is a、um, discipline highlighting the、uh, interdisciplinary、uh, relationships among various uh, uh, subjects and matters and uh, uh, periods and areas and the methodology. Let us、uh, just give these two distinguished scholars、uh, another warm hand. Thank you very much for your contribution, and we congratulate you again on receiving the great honor of the Tang Prize. I think these two scholars have won the Tang Prize, the Tang Prize. We are very honored to be here to listen to the two scholars. 和宋代有关的艺术以及商业以及相关的不同的学术研究领域的综合性的报告。那么在这里呢，再一次的谢谢他们为汉学界所
做的贡献。那么演讲结束呢，也容许我再一次的也谢谢大家到场聆听这一次难得的盛会，在此告一段落。谢谢，谢谢。谢谢王院士为我们主持。Thank you very much, Dr. Wang, for hosting this lecture session for us. And thank you again to our laureates, Dr. Owen and Dr. Shiba. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of the Sinology lecture. Thank you very much for your participation. If you have any questions regarding this lecture, you're welcome to join the press conference on the first floor. 